Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I'm here with somebody I've spoken to, uh, spoken about on this channel over and over again. Personal hero of mine, a legend, and I do not use that term lightly, a legend of magic. Somebody who has published so much amazing commercial material and changed the game over and over again. The one and only, the ultimate worker, Mr. Michael Close. How are you doing, Michael? I'm fine, Craig. Thank you for inviting me. This uh, this is uh, real nice of you. Appreciate the kind words. No, it's very true. And and really, I, I, I want to talk about your whole career, but I mentioned this to you when we were chatting over email. One of the big defining moments in my career was when I first saw you lecture at Blackpool. I think it might have been when Workers 5 was just being published. I'm, I'm fairly sure it was. Uh... Was it a was it a one day convention then, or had it had it expanded oh, into it, a longer it gone, convention? It had gone, yeah, it expanded at that point. Yeah, because I've been to Blackpool twice, and um, yeah, I guess I did lecture there. Um, yeah, talk about Workers Five. Um, mm -hmm. The first, I, I'm not sure if I lectured the first time I was there. I might have, but it was uh, the first time I was there. It was still a. Um, you know, just a, an evening, a day before and, a, and you know, it was the one day, it was the one day thing where you start at eight in the morning and you don't get back mm -hmm. to your room until one in the morning to pack to leave. But, uh, well, I'm glad it had an impact yeah, on you. I remember watching you perform the card, the salt shaker in the face, and I had never been so fooled in my life. And two things I remember to this day from that performance, the one was that routine. And the second one, was unlike any other lecture I'd seen up until that point. You you opened the lecture just by chatting to people for about 10 minutes first. I remember the joke you told. It was the uh, eat, shoots, leaves, the panda in the restaurant, eat, shoots, oh, leaves. Yeah. And I just love the fact that you were just getting to know everyone in the audience before you even started lecturing. And that just made a big impact. And then you went on to just completely destroy me with the magic you were performing. And it was like, this is great. It was the oh, whole well, thanks. Um, that, that salt shaker routine was a lot of fun to perform. Um, I had the benefit of working it out. But the one thing that's interesting about the salt shaker routine is it was never really designed to be done for a crowd of people. In other words, it wasn't designed to be done with the performer in front of a you know 50 or 60 or 100 people or whatever it might be. It was designed to be done at a restaurant table. It was really a, a restaurant trick. And uh, because obviously there's things going on in that routine that if you're not watching it at the table with me, you're going to catch, you know, I'm going to get busted a few times, but there's always going to be two or three things like the deck going under the salt shaker that everybody's going to miss no matter where you're seated on the thing. And the fact that the shaker disappears. So, uh, it was a surprise to me that it plays as well as it plays, um, and then it sort of has uh, that element of the paper balls over the head that as long as the, the people who are helping me continue to be fooled, then the audience enjoys that. They don't feel like they're being cheated because they can see how a few things are done. You know, that, so that makes it half, uh, you know, part of the fun. So the, it, it's, a, it's a great routine to perform. I've, I really enjoy performing it. It's... Uh, it's one of those tricks that when you get it to a performance level and you have confidence with it, uh, you really, you know, can feel like you know what you're doing with palming playing cards because you know there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, chop stuff going on there that you've got to be able to do. But it was uh, it's really fun. And and to your first point about speaking with the audience, um, I'm one of the few guys. Maybe there's others. I don't know who feel like. It isn't that that the most effective way to uh, deal with a group of people when you're a magician is to walk out and hit them with a magic trick in the first 30 seconds. I, I tend to think that the most important thing is to establish yourself as a human being. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, Douglas Adams, a mostly harmless human being uh, first, and then get into what it is that you're going to do. Now, for a long time, uh, and believe it or not, just this little this little segment of that um, was just something that I thought about and uh, incorporated instinctively without understanding anything theoretical behind it. But it turns out that there's a theoretical reason for it 
which is um, the way the brain works, that we have system one and system two. And system one is the part of the brain that gets us through everyday activities that we are familiar with. System two is the one that gets alerted if there's any kind of sense of danger. You know, what was that noise in the bushes? I don't know if that was a tiger or what, but system two is the one that, you know, in your caveman brain wakes you up and says, we better check that out or we better go hide in the cave or what have you. So anytime you walk up, uh, I'll use a restaurant as an example, you walk up to a group of people or at a cocktail party even, um, since you're basically just interrupting people, uh, system two is on fire. And system two is also the system of your brain that's going to be trying to figure out how magic tricks work. And as much as possible, I want to be in control of that side of your brain. Excuse me. So the best way to do that is to establish yourself as somebody who's not a threat. Because then system two analyzes you, say, oh, okay, this guy, this seems like a nice guy. Okay, it's fine. And now you go in to do what you need to do. So it's humanity first, magic trick second. And that, that's been a way that I've uh, performed now 40 years, probably, with that kind of an approach. It's, a, it's an amazing approach. And I want to talk about, I want to talk about a lot of that side of things. But before we do, just for anybody who's not, heard of you before and I can't imagine there's anybody that's watching this that hasn't but can we very quickly just talk a little bit about your origin story sure and, and and talk about how how did you find magic because at least as long as I've been in magic you've been around um but how did how did it all begin for you was it your typical story of uh, an uncle pulling a coin behind behind an ear well I was born on Krypton and my father knew the planet was going to be destroyed so he put me in a small spaceship and um, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and my father was in industry, uh, an engineer in industry. So we moved around a lot when I was a little kid, and we ended up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is a city in the Midwest, in the state of Indiana, up in the northeast corner. And I don't know exactly when it was. It may have been when I was about five. It might have been when I was six. But I was given a Sneaky Pete magic kit. And a Sneaky Pete magic kit was a pretty cool magic kit. It had some really nice uh, plastic props in it. And also in Fort Wayne was Dick Stoner's magic shop. Now, Dick Stoner is still around. He's uh, in his 90s now, early 90s. And I remember for my sixth birthday, uh, my parents took me to Stoner's and uh, I got some tricks. At least one of them I still own, a uh, little penny to dime thing with a little plastic block with a magnet in it that picks up the, uh, the metal penny shell. And Dick was really great uh, because he never sold me anything that was beyond what my ability was as a little kid. So we were there. Uh, in Fort Wayne for about, well, let's see, that would have been uh, until I started uh, grade six, sixth grade. And we moved from Fort Wayne to a little town called Lebanon, Indiana, which is in the middle of Indiana. It's about 25 minutes from Indianapolis where they hold the race. And there were no magicians around. So what I continued to do was to buy magic books pretty early on I, because we didn't have a lot of money, and uh, I sort of realized that bang for your buck wise, a book was much better than a prop, because I could buy a prop for 10 bucks and have one trick, or I could buy Harry Lorraine's close-up card magic for 10 bucks and have 60 tricks, and back then, a deck of cards was actually an inexpensive prop, and I had some digital dexterity because I was playing the piano back then, uh, taking piano lessons and things like that. So what I did uh, when we moved down to Indianapolis, or in, down to Lebanon rather, was I'd order books from Dick Stoner. And I read and I read and I read and I read. And was pretty isolated uh, in terms of contact with other magicians. And really didn't um, hang out with any. Uh, in 1970, I started at Purdue University as a math major and was there. Purdue was in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, about 45 minutes from uh, where I grew up. 
And I was at Purdue for two years and decided that I was never going to be a math major because the people who could really do it could really do it so much easier than I could do it that I was going to be playing catch up for the rest of my life. Uh, so I transferred to a school in Indianapolis called Butler University and uh, got my music degrees there. And it wasn't until after I left Purdue that I found out there was a magic club in Lafayette, Indiana. Didn't know anything about it while I was there. So uh, I would drive up to these once a month meetings. They were held in the, in the shop of a guy named Ron London, who was a, a really nice guy. He was a, had a, I knew of Ron because he was a disc jockey. I used to listen to his radio show when I was at Purdue, but didn't know he was a magician. And a bunch of us uh, hung out there. Um, it was not affiliated with any organization, uh, which really made it great because all the stuff that makes you hate magic club meetings didn't really happen. It was just really all about the magic, not about organizational who wants to be president next month. And we need to second the minutes of the meeting and all that stuff. So uh, uh, Tom Gagnon, who is well known among card magicians, uh, was there in that group from Kokomo, Indiana. A friend of mine named Rick Sweeney, who is sort of faded away from the magic scene, but a very clever guy. Uh, Dwayne Gillum, who still lives in Lafayette. And what we had going on at that club was somebody would do a trick. And then the next month, we'd all come back and try to fool that guy with the trick that he had done the month before. So where there was this sort of little informal contest going on about, and it was a great creative outlet to, to see how we could fool other guys with the thing that they just did. So that was really great for me. And then in 1972, when I started my uh, uh, training at Butler, uh, I found out that Harry Reiser was in Indianapolis. Now, I thought Harry lived in um, Chicago, and I knew him because he was sort of associated with Ed Marlowe. And uh, it turned out that he was now in Indianapolis, and I went over to his house, and um, that, that completely turned my life around because I knew about as much as I could know from reading books and I was extremely well read. But Harry's mentors were Vernon and Charlie Miller and a guy named Stuart Judah from Cincinnati, really great magicians. And through Harry, I got to see that uh, aesthetic, that, that uh, philosophical approach to magic happen. You know, their magic books are great but magic books are only really great depending on how well the guy who writes the book understands the material that he's writing about. So for example, you can find in Stars of Magic, uh, Vernon's handling for travelers, which is the four cards going to four different pockets. And I thought I knew that trick. I had practiced that trick. I'd worked on that trick. And when Riser did it for me, I had no idea what he was doing. And he was doing the Vernon handling out of Stars of Magic. But what was not conveyed in that write-up was the rhythm that is associated with that trick. Uh, there's, a, there's a real, you know, bum, 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 bum kind of a thing that goes on when those cards start coming out. And I didn't have that rhythm when I did it. And when you get that rhythm right, you know, the way that trick is constructed is so brilliant because you bluff the first one. And then from that moment on, the audience is playing catch up with you because with an empty hand, you show a card has already arrived in your pocket. Well, that's a dummy card. It doesn't, you know, it isn't the one you're looking for. And that throws you off enough that when the next four come, you're, you're running behind and never going to catch up. But in order for that to play properly, there's a rhythm in terms of the revelation of the cards going to the pocket. And that I did not have uh, correctly. So uh, Dick Stoner uh, and Harry were really the two biggest influences on me. And what Dick did was uh, he showed me that you could be funny when you're doing magic. And that's always been a big deal for me um, to be able to be funny at the same time you're doing a thing that you love to do. So for example, with piano players, I'm a piano player. Um, I was always enamored with Steve Allen and Victor Borga and Pete Barbuti and the people who could be really funny while they played the piano. 
And the same thing with magic. If I could be really funny while doing magic, that's what I wanted to do. And that's what Dick Stoner did. He's a very funny guy. And uh, so that was the entertainment side of things came from Dick Stoner. And from Harry, it was this aesthetic about how tricks should be constructed, um, the manner in which uh, the moves you use. Um, with Harry, it was never, uh, it wasn't like formal lessons or anything like that. I'd go to see him maybe once or maybe twice a week if I had time to do that. Maybe if you know his schedule was busier than mine, I might see him only a couple times a month. But I would come to him with things that I had been working on or things that he had been working on. And it was in, the, in, in his analysis of the stuff that I was doing showing me a trick, you know, a way of thinking about constructing magic tricks. And I've kept that my entire life now uh, with his guidance. Um, the first time I went to his house, he, um, he only did one, one, he did one trick, one effect, but he did it over and over and over. And the effect was I would cut off a bunch of cards, look at the card I cut to, I'd bury it in the deck and he would find that card. And he did it over and over and over and over. And just before I left for the evening, he said, uh, hey, let me do that one more time for you. So he gives me the deck and he says, shuffle them first. So I shuffle them. He says, cut off a bunch, look at the cards you cut to. And I look and I've got it. He says, cut and bury it. And I did. And then he said, now shuffle them. I said, okay. Shuffle them up. Gave them back goes through, pulls out a card. What was your card? Three of hearts, boom, three of hearts. Good night, Mike. So I, I now I'm out the door. So over the next six months, um, we talked about the various methods he had for doing that. Uh, many of them were like sunken key card kind of situations, things where a Pharaoh shuffle brings the key card and the card you cut back together. Very ingenious ways to do this. But he never tipped the last one to me. Never told me how that one worked. Finally, one day I was over there and I said, you know, Harry, we've been talking about all these, but how did you do that last one where I could shuffle the deck and you still found the card? He said, oh, I used a one-way deck. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, yeah. He says, you, you realize, don't you, Mike, you have to earn the right to use gaffed cards. And uh, a very profound statement, because the last thing I would have suspected was to have a guy of his technical facility do a trick with 52 of the same card. It, I'd never even crossed my mind as a possible method to use for that trick. So that was a great lesson. So um, that was basically how I, you know, my background, lots and lots of reading. I read everything I could get my hands on. And then... Uh, Harry's input and, and uh, influence on me in terms of trying to find methods for which there were no clues available. I mean, when, when people watched Harry do things, they would say, but he didn't do anything. And I thought that's the kind of magic I want to do. I don't want people to say, look how clever he is. Look how fast, he must have very fast hands. I want him to say, but he didn't do anything. So that's sort of where my uh, philosophy, my aesthetic approach to magic came from. And when you, you obviously um, majored in music and you finished university, anybody who's watched, uh, read about, read the workers' books, and we'll talk about those later on, but anybody who's read the workers' books knows that for a long time you were at uh, Illusions. When did you turn professional, Michael? Was it immediately after finishing university or did you get a proper job and you you've said yourself you're also a piano uh, a piano uh you, you play the piano did you ever consider going in that direction instead oh, of my entire life i've basically made my living two ways either through music or magic i've never there was only been a couple of times in my life when i had a real job um one was bailing hay one summer you know on uh, for a farmer who lived near us the Another was cleaning uh, a boiler, uh, a big power plant as part of a team cleaning a power plant. I mean, nothing convinces you faster that you never want to have to do something like that for a living than actually spending a summer doing that. But <clears throat> um, as, as a piano player, I had made money uh, playing piano from the time I was in high school. 
I would play with various bands and there was a local restaurant that had a piano and I played there on, I think Friday and Saturday nights, just background piano kind of things. And uh, so this would have been, you know, uh, well, I, you know, in the late sixties when I was still in high school. And then uh, of course, when I got to music school, I would, we had several bands there that I would play in and we would play gigs, but uh, I never wanted to do magic professionally. And the reason I never wanted to do magic professionally is because when you take something you love and you do it for a living, it changes how you feel about it. And it must change the way you feel about it because you're gonna have to do things you don't wanna do in order to play the gig. So, I mean, you know, if, if I don't feel like playing Proud Mary, but the crowd wants to hear Proud Mary, I'm going to play Proud Mary. You know what I mean? It's that, that kind of a thing. So, but on the, with magic, if I wanted to do a trick where people had to stand in line, close their left eye and look through a toilet paper roll tube to see the magic, I was going to do that. I didn't care if it was commercial. I didn't care if it was practical. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I was making <clears throat> a decent living as a musician. I taught at the college uh, for a while while I was working on my master's degree and taught music theory and taught some jazz uh, courses, things like that, things on synthesizers. But in 1978, 78 or 76, 78, I guess, a friend of mine named Steve Scomp, which is not a name that anybody would remember now, which is unfortunate because Steve was a really clever guy. Steve was a television producer in Indianapolis. And Steve worked at a place called Max and Irma's, which was a restaurant chain throughout the Midwest. And they had a policy of having magic at their restaurant. And Steve had been the house magician there for several years, but he got a job out in San Francisco. So he was gonna be moving away. And he wanted to know if I wanted to take over the restaurant gig. And I thought, oh man, do I really wanna do this? And I said, well, I'll, I'll before you leave, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go in there and work it for a while and let you know what I think. Well, as everyone who goes from having no practical experience in the real world to all of a sudden being thrust into a real world venue, you immediately discover everything you know how to do is, doesn't work because you can't sit down. You can't do lapping. You have no space to do routines out on a table where you're going to deal cards out, you know, what have you. So uh, there was that great shock of, oh my God, what am I gonna do? But I did enjoy the performing. I did like what was going on with it. So uh, that was my first challenge then to start looking for material that would be usable in those situations. And, and Max Hermes was a really nice laid back kind of a place. It, it was a goofy atmosphere. They had goofy stuff hanging from the ceiling and on the walls and every table had a telephone. You know, one of those old fashioned ones where you pick up the thing, you know, like you see in the, an old Cary Grant movie where he's playing in the newspaper office and he goes, operator, get me 794-4493. So anyway, you could dial other tables and it was a way to pick up people, I think, you know, on, with that kind of thing. Anyway, it was a fun atmosphere. And I ended up working there for six years, I guess, from 1978 to 84. And at the same time I was doing that, uh, my music career was getting busier and busier. I broke into the um, uh, recording work in Indianapolis. And you wouldn't really think of Indianapolis as a big place for recording work, uh, but it is. I mean, I don't know how much it is now because I've been away from Indianapolis for quite a while. But back then, um, a lot of places were coming in. Uh, for example, I was on, oh, I don't know, more than half a dozen uh, Disney on Ice uh, tracks. In other words, when they do Disney on Ice, the, the music is pre-recorded. Well, they would pre-record that in Indianapolis. Um, and the reason is there's a fabulous music school in Bloomington, Indiana, at uh, Indiana University. The Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra is a really fine orchestra with a lot of talented players, and they had some great rhythm section players there. So I ended up being first, second call uh, keyboard player uh, for all this recording work. And as the recording work got busier and busier, the magic became less and less interesting to me. And I just, uh, in 1984, 
a uh, friend of mine Mark, named Mark Lehman, who's from the same little town of Lebanon, Indiana, uh, also a magician. I said, would you like this gig? And he ended up staying there for almost 20 years, I think, wow. uh, until the restaurant chain uh, closed down. Uh, and then I put magic out of my life. Uh, I really did very little magic wise from 1984 to 1988. So um, just focusing on the music work that was going on. And that was fine too. I, in my life in, until recently, until probably about 1990 or 1988 when Illusions opened, um, I always put magic aside for a period of time. Uh, magic can make you crazy. It can absolutely make you nuts if you're not careful. And sometimes it's good to step away from that world of craziness. And I mean, that was before the internet. Uh, it could still make you crazy. So uh, it was good to put it aside. But of course, since the publication of the workers book started in 1990, uh, I really haven't stepped away from the magic world uh, that much. So, so that's how uh, my professional uh, work came about doing those things. Uh, and what made you, what made you, so you stepped away because you were really focusing on the recording work. You moved away from, from magic for a while. And then you said you came back in at around the, at the same time that you went to Illusions. What made you come back into magic? What made you decide to? Well, it was going to be, um, it, I was going to do it on a conditional basis. Um, Illusions uh, was started by a fellow named Chris Moore and Carl Andrews. Now, Chris uh, had a restaurant called The Magic Moment in uh, Florida. Uh, Paul Cummins was one of the people who worked with him. Paul was just a fantastic magician. And that's how I first learned of Paul Cummins because Chris Moore would just go on and on about this fantastic guy who he worked with at the restaurant in Florida. So they started this magic theme restaurant. And because of the way that the restaurant was structured, which was that every table got magic. In other words, you know, we seat, I guess we, we, we could seat 150 people and every table got a magic show at the end of the meal. So you need a, a lot more than one magician to be able to do that. So they needed a crew of magicians and a crew of experienced, uh, you know, table guys. So Carl contacted me and said, would you like to come this weekend? And this was right when they opened this. I was there from the day they opened. Uh, in the middle of June, 1988. And I said, okay. And the way I figured it was, you know, I'll go and help out this weekend. If I don't like it, I'm gone. And that'll be fine. Well, what turned out, I liked it a lot. And the reason I liked it a lot was because it was a magic themed restaurant, it eliminated the one thing that's hardest about doing restaurant magic, which is the cold call at the table. You know, you walk up and, you know, hello, I'm the magician, really? So, you know, and that's all gets eliminated when they, when they, if the people walked in the door, they came to the restaurant because they wanted to see magic. And that's a big hurdle avoided uh, by doing that. And there were some other really great magicians who were working there. So what happened was uh, after about three months, uh, Carl uh, left the restaurant and I became the supervisor of the magic staff. And so we had people like uh, Chris Kenner came from St. Louis and Homer Leewag who uh, came from uh, Cincinnati, uh, Mark Brandeberry, who's not a name that magicians know, but one of the funniest people on the planet and just a, a really outstanding magician. Uh, Steve Hart, who's now in Florida, uh, a bunch of guys uh, It goes on and on. And uh, Dan Daggert, who uh, came up from Florida, who used to work at the Magic Moment and joined it. So we had this group of magicians there. And right off the bat, when you're working with a bunch of magicians, you want to carve out your own identity as far as material is concerned. So and we also tried, if possible, not to do what other guys were doing to a certain extent. But in particular, I wanted to make sure that nobody was doing the stuff that I was doing. So, um, you know, I, as I was working at Max and Irma's, I was developing my own uh, routines. And when Illusions opened, the day that Illusions opened, I solved the problem that I had with the pothole trick. Um, 
which was, uh, and that's explained in the in the worker book if you want to go back and look at it. But uh, the idea with that is that Michael Weber showed the original trick to me in 1984, which is the, called the uh, one-two punch. It's moving a hole from a theater, from like a movie ticket to another movie ticket. And it was actually the texture of the ticket that disguised the work that you have to put into the into the tickets. And I was trying to find um, uh, business card stock that had that kind of texture and I could never do it. So for four years, I couldn't figure out how to do the trick. The minute Michael showed it to me, I knew I wanted to do a pothole trick because it related to Indiana and the fact that we have potholes there. Uh, and then the day illusions opened, I realized that all I had to do was to shade in the streets and that hid everything that you needed to hide. And then I could do the trick. So what happened at illusions that was so great, first of all, it was a lot of work. Um, on the weekend, uh, like I say, we seated 150 people. We would turn the restaurant three times, which means I would do my first table. They seated people about 4.30. So by 5.30, I was doing my first table. And then I wouldn't end till one o'clock in the morning. And in between doing all those tables, we do two stand-up shows in the bar. So it was the opportunity to constantly, you know, you'd walk in on Monday and go, I got an idea for a new thing, but I don't know. And by Saturday, you knew if it was gonna work or not because you had a chance to do it a hundred times during the course of the week and, and to get feedback from the other magicians who were there, which was really great. So, um, Illusions was really a fruitful uh, uh, and, and inspiring uh, place to be. It had its problems as all places have their problems, but in terms of being able to generate new material, I mean, and this is the place where I started to do memorized deck magic because um, two years into it in 1990, I said to myself, you know, I don't know when I will ever have another gig like this. If I'm going to learn a memorized deck, I better learn it now because I can be doing it every night. And, and I did. And that's how my skills with the mem deck got honed uh, you know, pretty sharply during that time. So that was the whole thing about uh, illusions and getting back and doing it professionally. I didn't know if I was going to like it. Turned out I did. And so I, I stayed with it. Um, and then what happened was other than doing recording sessions, my other music work, you know, playing gigs like wedding reception things, things like that, I had to bow out of a lot of that work simply because it conflicted with the illusion stuff in the evening. But uh, but I still did uh, recording sessions and things like that. I just didn't gig a lot, you know, having to drag all the gear, schlep it up, uh, kitchen elevator into the ballroom, that kind of thing. Yeah, I can imagine it's a lot easier to go to a gig with a pack of cards than Absolutely it is. right. Absolutely <laughs> right. Perfect. Well, you mentioned the pothole trick. One thing that uh, anybody who's studied your work will notice very, very quickly is you seem to have this ability of taking something and making it really logical. Uh, the pothole trick is a perfect example. People move holes around for no reason on playing cards. That is the perfect, especially as you say in Indiana, it's the perfect presentation for a moving hole trick. The other one that springs instantly to mind is your clones routine it makes sense of wild card because you're, you're, you're talking about DNA and cloning and then you've got the kicker with the nose on the face, which is hilarious. Is that something that you've always tried? Is that, is that something that you've actually tried to do or is that something that's just happened as you've- No, that, that, doesn't happen, that doesn't happen by coincidence. Um, the biggest hindrance for me as to whether or not, if I read something that somebody's come up with, or I, you know, find a trick that's on the market or whatever, the thing that's going to decide whether or not I ever perform that trick is if, is what can I say while I'm doing it? If I can't figure out something to say that makes sense to me, that takes this thing that is a puzzle and gives it some sense of meaning for the people who are watching it, uh, I'm not going to do it because it's just going to feel unsatisfying to me. It's just, I never, the older I got, the less I wanted people to look at me as the guy who does tricks. I wanted it to be more than that. So I, I figured out that a way to do that is if you can weave this story, some type of story that goes in. Now, I don't mean it has to be a big storytelling thing, but there has to be a premise. 
there has to be a plot. So, you know, uh, and the guy who's really great at this as well is Michael Weber. So, you know, with his one-two punch trick, well, if you hand somebody a ticket and they punch it and the hole indicates that you've used that ticket and it's no longer good, well, then it would certainly be an advantage if you could take that hole off and put it on another ticket. And now you've got a fresh one that you can reuse and go back to the movie again. So see, just that bit of, of internal logic takes it and makes it more than just a trick because it gives it a grounding in some type of reality. So uh, with the pothole trick, and like I say, Michael showed me the one-two punch trick in 1984, fooled me completely. I had no idea how it worked. But I knew as he talked with me and he explained what was going on with it, I knew that I wanted to do it with a pothole. And so the method for that trick, the idea of having one card already with flaps and the other cards with holes put back in, uh, but combining outs with it so you could draw logical maps. In my head, I knew instantly, so that was kind of a Mozart moment, I guess. I knew exactly how, but then I couldn't see how to hide the work. And that took four years to figure out the most obvious thing. The, the clever stuff I got immediately, the obvious thing took me four years. So uh, it's the same thing with, with um, card warp. Um, card warp's a fine trick, but I want to give it some meaning. So uh, using a dollar bill or a $2 bill or whatever and folding it and saying it's an origami time machine accomplishes a couple things. First of all, you've changed the trick to, from a card turning inside out to a card going backwards in time, which is something that keeps system two busy as it's trying to figure things out. And you've put the heat on the bill, which is ungaffed because now it's the item of interest. The playing cards have no interest. The bill is what's interesting. And it, there's nothing, uh, it can be examined until you know, the cows come home. So this is, uh, this is really something that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, in some of my later stuff in the Paradigm Shift books, there's a trick called the Ikea card trick. Now, the Ikea card trick is basically a trick called Vernon's Variant, which is a do-as-I-do do do trick. It's in one of the Lewis Ganson Ultimate Card Secret books. Um, you have four cards. Spectator has four cards. You go through a procedure of turning them face up and face down. And when you're done, all your cards are face down, but the spectator has one face up card. So I learned that you know, when I was a kid. And then I saw Tono Nosaka do a version of it where at the end, uh, the card that keeps turning face up has an odd colored back, which is a, an astonishing conclusion. But I didn't have anything that put that trick together. It was just a card trick. And more important for me was, it's a card trick that the spectator never gets right. And that's not the relationship I want with the people I'm performing for. I don't want them to look stupid. So, I mean, I saw Tones did his trick easily 15 years ago. And I, I don't remember when I did the Paradigm Shift books, but there's a few years back, a couple, three or four, three years back, I guess. Anyway, but I didn't have the presentation. And then in the course of moving and moving and moving, which uh, my wife and daughter and I did uh, several times, we moved from Las Vegas, Indiana. We were in Indiana for a while, and then we moved to uh, Canada, and we were in Mississauga, which is a western suburb of Toronto. Then we moved to a little uh, place called Richmond Hill, which is a northern suburb of Toronto. And every time we moved, we had to take this IKEA furniture, take it apart, and put it back together again. It's the single most frustrating thing in the world. And I, all of a sudden, I went, oh, well, this is that Vernon Varian card trick because we're not doing a thing with card, we're putting together Ikea furniture. And so that's the hook. And all I'm trying to do is portray what the instructions say and the lady's trying to follow along and she always gets it wrong, always gets it wrong, but it's never her fault. And as the routine goes on, I explain why that wasn't her fault. And then at the end, of course, uh, we're trying to put together a, a four-card uh, Nurburgring is the name of the thing we're trying to put together, 
And at the end, I say, well, see, we've been trying to put together a blue four card uh, Nürburgringer, and you've got a part from a bourbon Nürger, uh, you know, and, and, so, and it's red backed and it has bourbon Nürger on the back. Anyway, what's interesting about this presentation is the minute I start the patter, every single person watching embraces the trick and the concept, and it is a shared experience because everybody knows what a pain in the ass it is to put together IKEA furniture. But I would never have performed that trick for anyone until I came up with the, with the, um, with the hook, with the premise. And that's a big deal for me. If I can't figure out the hook, I can't do the trick. So do you have any advice for magicians that are watching this as to how they can make tricks their own and how they can make them more engaging for their audiences? Well, it's, um, you know, it's like asking Oscar Peterson, how do you play that lick? Well, I hear it and I play it. Mm. And the big problem is the hearing part. You know, uh, Chick Corea, the great jazz piano player says, you know, if you don't hear it, don't play it. And the thing is, you sort of have to orient your mind into that kind of thing. And there are some, first thing that's important is, is to be a well-rounded person. And a lot of magicians don't take the time to do that. I've always said, if you're not interesting to be around when you're not doing magic, you're not going to be interesting to be around when you are doing magic. Um, so you need to read a lot. You need to be well-read. You need to be read on current events. You need to read literature. You need to know more than, than movies and TV shows. You need to be able to talk on various subjects. Uh, and then as you're working on a trick, I look at a trick and I say, well, what does this trick mean to me? Does it mean anything to me? Is, is there anything that at all that I can figure out where this, you know, and, and it's not something that happens all the time. I mean, you really have to, uh, you really have to work through that. You know, it's, um, it's not fast, it's not easy. But if you can figure out what it means to you, then you have a much better shot at constructing something that will be meaning for the meaningful to the people that you're watching. And you know, it isn't an absolute prerequisite that you do that. Um, uh, Michael Skinner was a fantastic magician, absolutely fantastic, one of the best I've ever seen. But many of his presentations were rather pedestrian, rather standard. But what you got when Michael performed was, there was, what came through was how much he loved the tricks that he was doing for you. You could see that in him. You could, uh, you know, they were important to him. And in the same way as if you had taken time and carved little beautiful ships out of wood or done scrimshaw in ivory or something. And you said to somebody, look at this. And they go, wow, you did this? That's really, you know, so there was that kind of intensity that they meant something to him, even if they didn't have, you know, a big hook. And he would also find hooks. I mean, my favorite was when he used to use, um, what was the name of that? Jumping gems. It's like a hot rod, but it's two black sticks which have diamonds that appear. Yeah, two little black uh, rods. And he called them Liberace's piano keys. Well, right away, since he's working in Las Vegas, this is a reference every single person yeah. you know, knows about. Um, I have a routine called um, uh, the cheating lessons is in uh, closely guarded secrets. And that was devised specifically for the Houdini lounge room in the Monte Carlo that I worked simply because gambling kind of tricks uh, played very well there. And um, when I used to do this trick at the tables there, I would point out the eye in the sky and we'd talk about the eye in the sky a little bit. And I'd say, you know, it's everywhere you go, you know, except in your, in your hotel room and uh, in the restrooms, every place else, there are the eye. And I said, can you see the one for this room? And I'd point at it up on the ceiling. And I go, I'm gonna turn myself so my back is to the eye in the sky. As I tell you, I've been taking cheating lessons, card cheating lessons. Well, that's like the greatest hook in the world. And now, Whatever you do, you could do any trick at that point, but you, you hook them with that and now you're in. And so that's how that trick came about. Um, also in uh, 
closely guarded secrets is a trick called the luckiest cards in Las Vegas. And it's basically that's, cool. that's one of my favorite tricks. I perform it all the time with the casino cut cards. Yep. And the casino. Most amazing. That is my favorite trick to do with a mem deck. I love that trick. I think it's really one of the best mem deck tricks out there. It is so forgiving in terms of the estimation. I mean, it doesn't require, uh, you know, a lot of skill and estimation to get that to work. But that could simply have been a sandwich trick because that's really all it is. It's basically a card location using one card first and then two cards is like a sandwich effect. But if you just did it with jokers, there wouldn't be a lot to it that had any meaning to it. But the minute you bring those cut cards into play, all of a sudden this trick means something uh, beyond what it would normally be. So uh, the other thing that's nice about having this kind of approach to doing a routine is, if you start by talking about this kind of story or, or the story of the cut cards or what have you, people get hooked on the story and they don't know when the trick began. You know, Bob Farmer, who's my good friend, uh, another Canadian magician, one of the cleverest people I've ever known in my life, said that the thing that's insidious about me is that he never knows when he's supposed to start paying attention because all of a sudden he'll be listening and realizing, oh crap, I should have been watching. I don't, I don't, where did those cards come from? Did it, you know, how did that, you know, so that goes on. But uh, the first thing is to be as well read as you can be uh, because the best ideas come from outside of magic. And then you apply them to something. And I mean, like, the, um, you know, there's all kinds of things like that. Um, and then, um, and then as you look at the trick, you have to say, why does this trick appeal to me? And what about it can be couched in a way that it in some way corresponds to a real life situation of, of some type, of, of any type. Um, you know, there's, um, and, and, and basically what you're doing is you're, you're, you're adding some meaning and some content, some, uh, intellectual content to what you're doing. I mean, that you know, you really should be expressing some point of view through the, the material that you're doing. Um, you, you just don't want to be another, you know, an interchangeable head on top of the cheesy tuxedo. I mean, you really want people to, uh, to know about that kind of thing. So it's not, not easy. I wish, you know, if I had a guidebook that you could follow step by step and be able to do this, you know, I'd charge a thousand dollars for it, and everybody would be happy. But it, it just tends to be, uh, and this is incidentally, this is also why so often um, it's difficult to take anybody else's trick. I mean, look at Paul Gertner and the cups and balls with the steel ball bearings. I mean, there's a trick that people have done for years. Paul looks at it and turns it into a trick that applies to him. Growing up in Pittsburgh, a steel town, it makes perfect sense for him to do a cup and ball trick with steel ball bearings. Absolutely makes sense. On the other hand, when Ricky Jay does the cups and balls, he gives you a history of the cups and balls. He turns it into a history lesson, and that's the hook. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch the people who do that, uh, you don't want to copy them, but if you can be inspired to seek out things of your own, then, then that's really great. And once you do that, once you come up with that hook, especially if it, it's really about you, then nobody can take that routine from you. Nobody is ever going to do that trick as well as you do. And you know, you're going to be the guy when you see somebody do a trick and uh, you know, if you, if you have a trick like that, Craig, you know, and, and I know about it, and somebody does a similar trick, I go, well, that's okay, but you really need to see Craig do it, because he's the guy who's, you know what I mean? It's that kind of a thing. It's that kind of a thing. So um, anyway, I, I hope I answered your question. That was a pretty long, rambling answer, but that was an amazing the process, the process is long and rambling as well. So that, that was, that was, that was amazing advice. Let me ask you a question, Michael. Why did you start? So Going back to being at uh, Illusions, you obviously started in about 88. Mm -hmm. And in 1990, you published the workers' book. You published the first workers' book. Right. 
what made you decide to do that? Because at the time you were, you know, you were busy recording music, you were running the illusions, you were performing all the time, you were creating, you've created all of these routines for your own. Right. And now you're suddenly starting publishing them. It was, was it a desire? These days you see a lot of people, and you know this because you've reviewed magic for years, you see a lot of people that have a desire to be magic famous. So they release product, but I, I have the feeling that wasn't your your goal with this? Well, no, it was actually out of self-defense. Um, if I had had my druthers, nothing I've ever come up with would ever have been published. None of it, none of it. But because of my desire to be doing things that nobody else is doing. In other words, you know, however, reality rears its ugly head. And I had tried as much as possible to keep the pothole trick away from magicians. So if I knew you were a magician and you came to illusions, you weren't gonna see the pothole trick. You weren't gonna see the pothole trick. You weren't gonna see the frog prince. Uh, I might do other things, but those two things you were never going to see. But sometimes people didn't announce that they were magicians. And word was getting out about this trick that I did, this pothole trick. So I basically published the first worker's book as a protective, you know, to, to establish credit for uh, those four things. There were only four things in the first book. There was the pothole trick. There was uh, Dr. Strange trip, trick, the uh, card warp routine, and um, the origami bunny souvenir and the little hand on the stick gag. And that was really just done to, to make sure that people understood where this, where this came from. Mm -hmm. Because stuff slips out, stuff slips away, stuff gets out into the magic world and then somebody publishes and now you're running, playing catch up to get people to understand, well, it wasn't that guy's idea, this is my idea. So the good news was when the, when the first book came out, um, it sold. I mean, it was done very, uh, you know, very uh, mediocre production values. I mean, I, the, the equipment I was using was crude. I still um, have my original spiral bound copies over there, all five and, of them. And you can be, you will be pleased to know that each of those copies has my DNA on it because I bound all of those personally. I'd sit in my basement with a machine and I'd punch them and I put the plastic comb binding in. So, uh, but what was nice was that was the first time I would ever making money and I didn't have to be there. Because you see, when you're a musician or a magician, if you want to generate income, you have to be there. Here, I could sell this thing and it generated income without me having to leave my house, except to go to the post office and mail things. So uh, that's where the first book came from. And then, uh, of course, there was the situation with the Frog Prince, which was just a horrible misunderstanding that uh, Scotty York published his version, uh, which was not even the same trick. It just used the frog before I had a chance to publish my version. So that's what, when Workers 2 came out, that's really was the main thing was to get the Frog Prince in there and to get a couple moves like the spread double lift and, and things like that established. And then, I was kind of hooked on the fact that, you know, people were really enjoying the books. I was hearing from people that they were valuable and I was, I was being invited to go places. So you mean, here's a kid from Indiana and I'm being asked to go lecture in Japan or go down to Argentina or, you know, all these crazy things that I never thought would happen. Um, and, you know, I had a stockpile of material that I thought was really good. I sort of made the commitment that I wasn't going to publish anything that I hadn't used professionally that had a lot of flight time with. So all the kinks had been worked out. And um, so then, you know, the third one had the salt shaker routine. That was the, the big one in that. There's other, and in the third one, then I started to put some essays in print and establishing my approach uh, to various things. Um, four uh, is one that people don't talk about very much, but it has a, a bunch of stuff that I think are really fine routines in it. Uh, and then, of course, the fifth uh, worker's book had the Memdex section, which really got, at least in the United States, really got everybody fired up about doing Memdex. 
Same I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Simon Aronson and Juan are the godfathers of that kind of stuff. But Simon was not really going out doing it. Um, and so, and I had a different approach from Simon. I mean, the guys who talked to me about Memdeck, uh, you know, I say, well, what are you going to use? What are you going to do with it? What do you want to do with it? What do you, how are you going to use it? And what they don't understand is I had a specific reason to learn Memdeck when I learned it. And it wasn't because of anything Simon really had built in that stack, although the cards uh, 10 through 15 spelling was really helpful. But it was the fact that I was going to improvise with it or riff with it, which is, I think is a better term now. So I knew how I was going to use it. I had a purpose. And that stack worked fine for that purpose. So anyway, that was the, the worker's book. And uh, that was also wrapping up a, a really a dark time in my life. Um, and I was going through some really ugliness in the relationship I was in. And I, and I mentioned this in some of the books, I was not the nicest person to be around. I was carrying tons of anger with me. And unfortunately, the person that that anger should have been directed at, I didn't. And instead, everybody else got the brunt of it, you know. But, um, but those five books hold up remarkably well. Uh, I, I have yet to see anybody publish a variation of anything in the worker's book that isn't either a move backwards or a move laterally. Um, they're, they're just not being improved in a way that actually improves the trick. So, um, you know, if, if you talk about the frog prince, um, the thing I'm trying to work out and I, and I worked on it and then I discarded it and I may go back to it, but I, I was working out a way to do it without uh, having to do the crossing the gaze switch. So you could get rid of that whole section and even streamline the trick even more. And um, it's really funny because <clears throat> I was walking my dog and it, it popped into my head this idea I had about streamlining. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could do this kind of a thing. So now I've got a new approach to, to take. But I mean, if, if you're going to vary something, you really have to figure out what is the weak point that you think needs to be corrected. And many times the things that people change is simply something that's too difficult for them to do well. So with the frog prints, uh, it's not the same trick if you replace the spread double lift force with a riffle force, because you cannot get the fairness that that spread force allows you uh, when you're doing the, when you're doing, and that's the whole trick hinges on that. So I've seen people, I mean, and there's been lots of, of variations on the frog prints. Uh, Jorge Blas uh, came on uh, Fool Us and did his version, which is a really full blown production number with a live frog showing up and a, a real live prince showing up. I mean, it's a really a big deal. Um, I've seen Bernard Bilis do it on uh, French television. Uh, a Swedish, I think he's a juggler, did the frog prince on a, like a Sweden's Got Talent kind of thing. It's interesting to see what these guys have done and, and taken uh, with it. But uh, in, in none of those cases, do I, you know, they've all been interesting, but they've taken it out of what the trick was designed for, which was a restaurant trick that resets immediately and you can do and just walk up to a table and do it and leaves the people with a souvenir. So that was always, you know, you know, if you have a guy hiding under the table, you know, I can do a heck of a routine, but I can't stroll with that, you know. Hi, I'm Michael. This is Ferdinand. He'll be under the table doing some things that, uh, but ignore him, please. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that struck me about the work of series and why I fell in love with them myself is uh, the name of the book, Workers. I remember reading books beforehand and the majority of books I read, I'd get frustrated because I'm like, well, I'm not going to sit at the table. I'm not going to be in a situation where I can do an impasse or, or, or it'll start lapping. Uh, David Roth's work, I mean, David Roth was amazing, but I mean, I read the books and I was like, oh, this is not going to apply to me. And then when I started looking at the Worker series, every single trick, even if it wasn't the sort of thing that I would personally do myself, you could tell that every trick was worked in and it was designed to be actually performed. And, you know, before we sat down and talked, I was thinking about all of the things that I do that <laughs> are part of your repertoire from those books. And, you know, we haven't mentioned stuff like the El Cheapo Magic Club. Uh, there's a million things that we could talk about that. I mean, the reason I learned to memorize deck is because I wanted to do your handling of the invisible deck. 
Oh. That was the reason. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's it's such a noble goal. I mean, the reason that most magicians do the same six tricks is because those are the ones that you can do any. So you do the sponge balls or the sponge bunnies, or you do ambitious card, or you do card to wallet or something like that. These have become standards simply because they are workers. I mean, I didn't I didn't coin the term workers. It's a thing that, you know, I would talk to Roger Klaus or Jennings or some of the, those kind of guys and somebody do a trick and they go, oh yeah, that's a worker, that's a worker. I did popularize it, but in popularizing it, I tried to establish exactly what the criteria are if something is a worker. And unfortunately, in the 30 years since that book has been published, and it really put it out as the common vernacular now uh, that magicians use. So I see every other trick that's put on the market is a worker now, and pretty much none of them hold to that very strict criteria. I mean, you don't want angle problems. You, you don't want all kinds of table conditions and things like that. It should be, you should be able to reset it in 30 seconds or so. Um, this is, of course, why I changed the way I do Memdeck magic, because Simon was doing great tricks, but they destroyed the stack. Well, I don't have three minutes to reset. I've got 30 seconds to reset in the, in the play, you know, in the way that I was doing it. So anyway, um, and, and this is a project everyone should be working on is to, to find these things that don't work. You know, is there a way I could do this trick where I wouldn't have to lap anything? You know, what else could I do that would change that? And I loved lapping. God, did I love lapping when I was a kid. I mean, everything went into the lap. And uh, now, of course, lapping has uh, come back uh, you know, sort of with a vengeance. I think uh, Jan Frisch has had a, a big influence with his FISM winning act. His approach to lapping, though, is a different, uh, uh, a different approach than Slidini's approach to lapping. And uh, what's interesting about that is that if you're trying to do it on TV and you really don't want people to know that things are coming in and out of your lap, you really have to go back to Slidini's methods of doing those kind of things because television uh, deprives you of all misdirection. So you have to uh, you have to work things deliberately. But you know, I'm all for anybody coming up with a way to take a trick that couldn't be done and go, hey, you know, now it can be done. Oh wow, that's a fantastic thing. You know, that's that's absolutely great. So that's still what I do. It's still what I'm uh, you know I think about all the time because. You know, I, I want tricks that I can do anywhere. I don't want to have to, you know, and, and magicians do too as well. And I think the other thing that made the workers book sort of stand out is um, you, you have to be really careful when somebody writes up material, you know, like let's take Lewis Ganson uh, for example. I mean, I think Ganson did a really a good job with the Vernon books, but there's stuff that isn't in there. And uh, the stars of magic, the burden stuff that's in there. If you're going to write up somebody else's material, you really have to make sure you understand what the thinking was behind that. And so I was never going to have anybody else write up my stuff. I mean, I'm a, a voracious reader, so I knew a little bit about how to write. Uh, I know a lot more about how to write now than I did 30 years ago. But what I tried to do is make sure that that my thinking process was made clear in those routines. Because if you can understand the thinking process, you can apply that to something else that you might want to do that isn't my trick, but it's your trick that you're working on. And I think that's really important uh, factor there. So, and you know, I'm very gratified that, you know, there's so many people for whom, uh, just a fellow who was, uh, uh, we just got done recording uh, season eight of Fool Us. And one of the acts that was on was, you know, telling me that, you know, workers books were the first books that he ever bought and doing all the stuff so it's very gratifying to hear that i'm really uh you know the book will certain the books will outlive me and uh, you know it's very nice to know that they'll go out in the future and people can talk to me through the time machine that is a book absolutely but on the back of that and obviously you've brought out a lot more written written publications since then we can talk about that but off the back of that you released two large LNL DVD sets 
you're one of the few people that did produce two. Like you had the workers volume one to four, I think, and then yeah. Devious. And then Devious came out. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, Lewis had been, Lewis was an old friend. I really like Lewis. I, he, you know, uh, he is, his passing was way too soon. He died too young. Um, and it had, you know, a medical condition that was just heartbreaking. But he did magic such a fantastic service with those L and L videos. And you know, I'm I'm tired of people bitching about the audiences there. You know, to be honest, I don't give a fuck about how the audience is reacting there. You are given the chance to see performers that you would never see in your life. Yeah. And uh, my experience doing those, I'll I'll talk about those a little bit. I mean, everybody says, oh, they're all pumped, they're all primed, and what have you. Well, here's here's the way I did that. This was a challenging shoot. So uh, Lewis had talked to me about doing these videos in 1998, he talked about it. And Lisa and I uh, were going to go on a 60-city, 90-day lecture tour through the United States and a couple places in Canada. And we needed product. So earlier in 1998, I said to Lewis, look, you've been bugging me to do videos. Let's just do a workers series videos. And I'll, you know, I'll try to get as much of that material uh, recorded for you. So I ended up doing 11 three trick sets, close up sets, and one five trick stand up routine. And we shot all of that in one day. And then the audience went home and after dinner, we started to do the explanations, which took a night and another day to do that. Now, what magicians need to understand about magic video, there's several things. First of all, magic video is not going to give you an ideal performance unless the trick was designed to be done on video. But if you're just shooting somebody who designed a trick that's to be done at a restaurant, then watching a video is not the same experience. You are watching other people watch the magic. You are one step removed. There is a time crunch. They have to get through as much material as you possibly can. So you're hoping for the best performance you can get without screwing anything up. That's important. You need somehow a way to get the audience to have the energy they need to have while you're doing it. So here's the, here's the way I approached Lewis's thing. And this came from Billy McComb, this idea. Every trick had its props in a small baggie, a clear baggie. The three tricks for that set, those three baggies went into a big freezer bag sized baggie. And I had 11 of those. So if a trick needed a Sharpie and another trick in a different set needed a Sharpie, there was a Sharpie in each bag. I never had to carry to keep track of anything. So here's what I would do. I would come out, I'd load my pockets with the first three tricks for the set. And then I'd tell jokes for about two minutes and get everybody laughing. And then we'd start and tape it we'd finish, I'd go into the back room, empty my pockets, throwing everything in the big baggie without sorting it out, load up the next set, come back out, tell jokes for two or three minutes to get everybody back to the where they were, do the next set, and I did that for 11 close-up sets. Now, I don't want anybody to tell me that that audience was giving me something that I didn't work for, because I worked my ass off for it to keep the level of their energy up. Because think how tough that is for people just sitting there watching this stuff. I mean, you know, it's oh, yeah, on and on. Now, in that situation, you may not get the greatest performance of a trick you've ever done. It's unlikely you will get the greatest performance of a trick you've ever done. You simply want it to be in some way representative of what the trick is going to look like, which is why no magician should ever judge a trick by the way they see it performed on a magic video. This is where text really has the benefit because in text, I can give you the ideal performance situation. I can tell you when everything works properly, this is how the trick goes. 
Now that may not happen every time you do the trick, but you have the information of how it's supposed to go when it goes. Um, uh, it's off the subject, but uh, there was a great jazz drummer named John Von Olin, fantastic jazz drummer, just one of the best ever, played with the Woody Herman band. And somebody said, what's the best night of playing you ever had in your entire life? He said, it was in a country club in Michigan. So, you know, there it was. It was just some out of the place, hole in the wall thing. And it was just a night where everything came together and only a handful of people heard them. So um, in that whole thing of doing 11 close-up sets and one stand-up show, we only reshot two things. One was in Dr. Strange Trick because as I folded the card at the beginning, it cracked and broke and we had to stop and start again. And in doing a trick called Take a Letter, the bag fell over. It didn't really spoil the trick for anybody, but those are the only two things that went wrong in all that magic. Now, are all of those the greatest performance I've ever given of any of those tricks? No, absolutely not. But they are representative and you get some idea about how that all works. Now, the other thing I should clear up about that first set of l and tapes is, people say, well, why did you have Mead and Michael Amar there? Because they almost said nothing through the whole thing. Well, that's just the way it worked out because I also had to explain 33 close-up tricks and five stand-up tricks that night and the next day. Now, uh, Eric was very familiar with my material. Michael was not. But Michael was brought on because it's an L&L project. And if Michael Amar's name is there, people will buy it because they see Michael Amar is on there. And I have no, nothing against Michael at all, but that's why he was brought in. So, you know, but, but what happened was this. Because I was so familiar with the material, I didn't forget anything. There wasn't a moment when Eric said, hey, did you, did you explain this? Or did you, hey, you forgot to explain that. Or, you know what I mean? That's what they were there for. They were my safety net if I forgot something. I didn't want to look back on those videos two years later and go, oh, shit, I completely forgot to talk about, you know, and so that didn't happen, but it could have happened. It just didn't happen. But anyway, that's why those two guys are there and they were great to be part of it. I'm really happy they were there. So um, that's that first set. And then we took those videos came out just as Lisa and I were heading out on this lecture tour. So we had product to sell and that was important. With the devious ones, you know, Lewis had been bugging me to come back. And I thought, well, okay, I've got some stuff. I mean, it, that devious set doesn't have the variety that the worker series has simply because most of that material came from working at the Houdini Lounge in the Monte Carlo. And what I discovered there was that cards were the most organic prop that you could use. If I brought out something other than cards, it just looked like a guy doing tricks. But at least with cards, it felt like it fit the situation. So there was a lot of card magic in that, in that bunch. But I'm really happy with the Devious set. I mean, there's some stuff in there that will fool absolutely anybody. It's the Devious set where you published your handling of the magnetized cards, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Just amazing. That line where, you know, it works on ego and uh, <laughs> brilliant line. Well, so and I'll tell you, there's a prime example. So here's this fabulous trick. I mean, and Gary Plants uh, makes, uh, you know, he, he stopped making them, but he makes them occasionally. Uh, and if they ever come up and they're available, you know, they, they're, they're a Cadillac of a prop. It's, it's just really gorgeous. But here's a prop that, or not a prop, but here's a trick that has no basis in the real world. These cards cling to my hand. Why? Why would that happen? Why would that happen? Well, <clears throat> I don't know why that would happen. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought. And then I start thinking about the words that are involved, whether that, you know, magnetize. Well, what do magnets do? Well, magnets attract. And because I have a penchant for wordplay, I thought, oh, they're attractive. Oh, that's why the cards cling to my hand. I am the most attractive man in Las Vegas. So that was the line, that was the line that, that, that gave me the pathway into the presentation for that trick. Uh, very important, when, until that line came to me, there was no chance that I was gonna perform it, even as wonderful as it is. And then 
um, you know, it, so what's holding the cards there? Well, it's my massively inflated ego. And the only way to get him to drop is to bring it in check. And then, of course, the woman looks at you and goes, oh, nice tricky trick, magic boy. And the cards drop. And, you know, it's it's really, um, it, uh, it's very satisfyingly constructed. And it lets you switch decks. It's the deck switch that really makes that trick worth doing. Because the, the trick that precedes it obviously uses a shuffle deck. And now those cards have been all mixed up. And now just in the act of putting myself back together from doing the, the magnetized cards, I've rung in a, a cooler and I can do the, um, what is that last trick? That's the luckiest cards in Las Vegas, I guess. That's the third trick in that set. So, um, and you know, uh, there's in all this stuff and, and in particular in those uh, tricks, um, the opening trick of that three trick set is, is uh, uh, oh man, Dan Garrett, sorry, his name just disappeared. Dan Garrett had a trick called four card reiteration. And I love the trick, love the trick. And I did it all the time. And then I came up with this pattern that personalized it for the Monte Carlo with Lance, the trick that Lance Burton showed me. And in that trick, uh, I got rid of what one of the things I just hate about card magic, which is adding cards on to the top of the deck. And it makes the trick a little more difficult because you've got to palm cards. But from the other side, from what the spectators see, it's so clean. So there's just all these lessons that I hope can be uh, learned. I mean, I, I, the, my hope about the books is that they're deep. I mean, that they're, that you, when, you know, as you go through, I, I love books that as you go through your progression as a human being, you'll go back to a book that you've read maybe a couple of times before, but because of your life experience and, and new maturity and what have you, you see things in that book that you completely missed the first time around. They didn't resonate with you. And I sort of hope that that's the way the workers' books and all the other things that I've published since then will be that, you know, as your experience grows, You'll go back and go, oh, I completely missed that the first time. Oh, yeah, I see. So um, uh, the devious uh, one was really fun to record. The crowd was just great. We had uh, just a really, a really fun time doing that one. And there's, like I say, there's some magician cooler, I mean, just magician cooler stuff on there that's really a, a treat to do. Absolutely. Let me let me ask you another question. While all of this was happening, you started to review magic tricks as well. Yeah. Um, and it's very difficult being a magic reviewer because as somebody who reviews magic, at least I find it difficult because you're always, you no one's ever happy. You say something's not very good and people say, Oh, you're you're just saying yeah. it's not very good. You say something's great and they question, you know, your motivation for saying that. Uh, did you find because you were a reviewer for a very long time. For it was magic, wasn't it? it was, yes. It was for magic for Stan Allen. Did you did you find that whole thing a difficult situation, or was it was it not? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> here's why I hung with that. Um, I started in 1995, and um, Mac King and I are old friends. And at the time, I was still living in Indiana, and Mac was in uh, Los Angeles before he moved to Vegas and got the, got the gig in Vegas. And our intent was to do uh, magic product reviews in a Siskel and Ebert back and forth kind of way. The problem with that was the technology really wasn't in place that could have made it easy for us to do like it is right now. I mean, it would have been so simple back then for us to have a Zoom call and then one or the other of us to simply transcribe what we said about it. And boom, there's our magic column. And we would get that back and forth that so many guys have going for them now when they do those kind of bad. So that's what we were shooting for. And so it was a really clunky, difficult thing to do. And then um, Mac got, um, Mac really hated the fact that he had to give a bad review to friends. And we ran into a real, uh, a real problem with our very first column because one of the books we had to review was a book by Carol Fox. And it was the last book that Carol wrote. Now, Carol Fox was an old friend of mine. 
I'd known Carol since 1976 at the first IBM convention I worked. The problem with Carol's book was it was not a book of creation. It was a book of recollection. And it was the recollection of other people's tricks, none of whose names he recollected. And that's a problem. So we couldn't give it a good review. I mean, by all extents and purposes, it was not a good book. Sure, it had good tricks in it, but they weren't Carol's tricks. So what are you going to do in a situation like that? So here's the way Mac and I looked at it. If we rolled over on it and gave it a good review just to make Carol happy, <clears throat> then our credibility would be gone for the rest of the time that we were going to review it. We had to establish that no matter who you were, we were going to try to present an honest review of the product. And this is the other thing I've said to people over the years, I don't review people, I review product. If I don't like your product, that's not saying I think you're a bad person. I don't like the product and here's why. So we gave Carol a less than favorable review, trying in every way we could to spin it, to say Carol has great material, if you're unfamiliar with it, you should start with this book or this book or this book. It's a little more representative. Well, Carol was furious, absolutely furious. And it completely ended my relationship with him. He was really angry. And he said, why did you give me a bad review? And I said, well, it's because it's not your stuff, Carol. It's not your stuff. And he says, show me where it is isn't my stuff. So I had to sit for a day and a half and take all the tricks and where they originally came from. I mean, one of the things he published was that if you're doing out of this world, if you have a pencil dotted joker in the deck, that as the spectator is going through, when you see the pencil dot, when they start to put it down, you go, you know, I, there's something funny about that card. Does that card feel funny to you? Put that one aside for a minute. And now when you show it, it turns out it's the joker that they put aside. That's a great idea. It's also in the original Paul Curry instructions for Out of This World. It's not Carol's idea. So anyway, and that, that killed it for Carol. And he, uh, he was really unpleasant around me uh, from then till the day he died. So Mac, after a year, just didn't want to do it anymore. I said, well, I'll continue. And the reason I continued was this. When I was growing up in that little town of Lebanon, Indiana, the only connection I had with the magic world was to see Genie Magazine. Maybe I'd see a linking ring. Maybe I'd see an MUM. And I'd read the reviews. And none of those reviews gave me an honest insight as to whether the tricks were worth buying. So I said to myself, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the um, advocate for guys who are like me, who don't have any other way to find out if something is good, bad, or indifferent. And so that was what, what I did. Um, mainly what I tried to do was to establish how innovative the product was. I sort of used Darwin's three rules. Does it improve the effect? Does it improve the method? Or does it improve the presentation? Does one of those things get improved by whatever is, if you're offering a variation of something? And if not, well, it's not really worth the money. If you're only moving it laterally, that, that's not really an improvement. And I tried to make it very clear uh, uh, you know, on those points, what I found was good and what I found wasn't good. And I, and I was able to continue that uh, you know, for as much of the stuff that, that, you know, that I could review. Um, it was much more difficult to write a bad review than to write a positive review. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. The good thing about me doing it for 10 years, which is how long I, I reviewed for Magic Magazine, the good thing for doing it for 10 years is, after a while, you begin to understand my taste. You understand my sensibility. So, for example, uh, you know, my brother-in-law and I have absolutely different tastes in movies. So that if he says he loved something, I'm probably not going to go see it. Mm -hmm. And if I loved it, he's probably going to hate it. But that's worthwhile. Once you get that figured out, you can use his review, you know, his judgment call and base your decisions on it. So that's worthwhile, which is really why it's good to have one person doing it for a long period of time. 
The hard thing is just doing it for a long period of time. The world of magic is not interesting enough that I can continually find interesting things to say about the products that I've done. But the but a bad review takes the most time because I have to justify that opinion, and that takes that takes a lot of words. I mean, I was really disappointed in um, the Don Allen book that John Rockerbomber wrote. And it wasn't really Rockerbomber's fault that it wasn't a very good book. Don Allen wanted nothing to do with the book. He was no help whatsoever. So all John could do was look at the Stevens Matt video of Don doing those tricks, you know, that were, are so familiar and watching the Magic Ranch videos and what have you. So the, the person who doesn't exist at all in that book is Don Allen because all the questions I would want to ask Don about, well, why, you know, the one thing I never understand is why he bangs that chow cup at the back of the table before he loads the ball. I've never understood that. But the answer isn't, the answer isn't in there. So that does take you a long time. Now, um, I do some reviewing. I, I did uh, review some uh, books, I guess, for Jeannie for a little while. And now in the newsletter that my wife and I put out every month, um, if there's a new book out, I will only review something if I'm enthusiastic about it. Um, I'm not gonna take the time to write a horrible review. The only time I might write a horrible review is if somebody who is well known and is sailing on their reputation releases something that is absolutely not worth the money. And then, you know, I just try to warn people about that. But there's simply too much product to be on top of any of it now it's just it's just way too much so well what would for somebody who's watching this obviously you you've hit the nail on the head there there's too much product people are releasing magic all of the time you know i refresh murphy's daily and when i do there's about another 20 or 30 tricks every day yeah um which i think is an issue to be honest anyway but if there's somebody watching this and they've got a trick that they believe in, that they maybe that they consider it a worker, as somebody who's reviewed magic for a long time and published their own magic, have you got any advice on making sure that that trick is not going to get trashed when they actually release it? Um, making sure that it gets a favorable review? Well, no. I mean, um, you have no idea. I mean, you're, you, you have to... Uh, it, it, I have told, I told people, because there were a few times when people got quite upset with some of the reviews uh, that I put in Magic Magazine. And I said to people, look, if you're unhappy with my review, don't say anything. I say, unless I have made a factual mistake in describing or explaining something about your trick, let it go. Because that review has a shelf life of 30 days. And then it's gone and a whole new slew of stuff and people will forget and they'll find your, your ad, your trick someplace and they'll probably buy it. But if you write a, an angry letter to the editor, then that's going to fill up another 30 days and keep that topic bubbled to the top. And then I'm going to have to write a reply to your angry letter. And it's going to end there. It's not going to go beyond that last letter. You know what I mean? We'll go back and forth once, but I'm going to get the last word on this. Um, so just let it go. So you really, you know, uh, the, the problem with reviewers is, I mean, it, it's like, you know, guys who review uh, jazz piano players, guys who review jazz records. If they're not piano players and musicians themselves, I have to think to myself, I'm unsure what right you have to be criticizing anybody who's doing what they're doing. I don't know that art can be reviewed. Do you know what I mean? Um, now, a magic trick can be reviewed with certain criteria. Is it practical? Is the reset time a lot? Does it use up a, a gaff every time you do it? Do you have to constantly buy something to restock? Is it performable in all kinds of practical conditions? Things like, is it difficult to do? What are the, what are the, what's the sleight of hand involved? And those are things that can make you uh, make an intelligent buying decision. But, you know, I wouldn't put out a product and explain to anybody that they really need to uh, 
you know, if I don't get a good review on this, I'm going to be unhappy with it because you just don't know what people are going to are going to say. I mean, I've had later books of mine, um, like the Paradigm Shift books and the Tom Epiphany and the, the Road to Ripsville thing, where I'm pretty positive the people who reviewed it really had no idea what I was going at with the thing. They, they just really missed the boat on the review. And that's that's the way it is. I mean, I can't, I can't, I, all I can do is to be as confident as I can be in the product I'm putting out and to know that it has achieved certain goals with, uh, you know, with what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do. But no, I'll and I'll tell you, putting out new stuff now, I mean, it's, it's more than a flood. It is a tsunami of, of, of stuff. And uh, I don't know how anybody keeps focused. I don't know how anybody focuses on one thing long enough to get it good uh, with all the product that's floating around out there now. It's, it's really tough. It really is. Um, we talked about illusion. We talked about illusions. Uh, very briefly, if we can, just because you've referenced it a few times, obviously you moved from Indiana to Las Vegas. Right. Um, where you had the residency in the Houdini Lounge. Right. Was uh, you've mentioned briefly? Obviously, you focused on the card material. Was there any other? Was it was it a difficult sort of transition to go and work there as opposed to illusions that you were at for years, or was it not a problem? Well, yeah, yeah, you know, um, there were there were really great things about uh, the Houdini Lounge. The, the greatest thing about the Houdini Lounge was I was both the magician and the piano player. They had a baby grand piano there. So um, I had little table tents that I put on the tables that said, um, if you'd like to see some magic, ask the piano player. And if you'd like to hear a particular song, ask the magician. So uh, I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, and what was really great about it was, and I worked a fairly long shift. I worked about a five hour shift in that bar. I think I went from eight in the evening till one in the morning. And I never took a break. Because if I stopped doing magic, then I just played piano. And then if I stopped playing piano, it was to walk out and do magic. And basically people would come and, and request me and I do magic. The other thing that was great about the Houdini Lounge was that it wasn't a restaurant. It was just a bar. And in a restaurant, um, whoever is running the restaurant has to factor you in to their table rental time. This is why most restaurants not magic themed restaurants, but just a restaurant. Most restaurants, um, what do I want to say here? Put the magic between the time that the waiter takes the order and the time that appetizers arrive. It's usually a break about 10 to 15 minutes, something like that. That's when they want you to do magic because that doesn't eat up any extra table rental time at the end of the meal. See, if you go to a table at the end, those people should be leaving so fresh people can get in and you're tying it up, you're tying up the table. So there's always this time element. Well, at the Houdini Lounge, they didn't care how long people would sit at this table as long as they were drinking, you know? And so I could do much longer sets. I could do a 20 minute set. I could do a 30 minute set if people were really enjoying it, uh, which allowed for a little more elaborate, a little longer routines than I would have done at Illusion. But by the same token, the venue itself had restrictions. The tables were round, not square. And you can't do the salt shaker routine on a round table. You have to have a square table because you need that corner to work off of. So that routine was gone. Uh, anything that was kind of lighthearted or whimsical, gone. Didn't fit the room, didn't fit the room. When you go into a magic theme place, there's a silliness just to that whole concept that allows you to get away with stuff. So the frog prince was gone. It was out, out, out of the way. You know, it wasn't going to be a trip that I could do. So I, and, and this is, uh, and I've written about this, venue will dictate your repertoire. Venue dictates repertoire. You have to adapt whatever you're doing to the room that you're in, and they're all different. So um, that was the main challenge, was just figuring out what was going to work and finally deciding that, um, that cards seemed to be the most practical thing uh, 
And that's where that three quick set of uh, the trick that Lance Burton showed me, the magnetized cards and the uh, Lucky's cards in Vegas. That was my one big, you know, 15 minute three trick set. That was really good. Uh, I also used Dean's box uh, a lot in there, but it was always an encore. Uh, if the table was really great and we really had a lot of fun, then uh, I would walk, I would say, uh, I don't show this to everybody, but would you like to see one more thing? And I go back and get the box from behind my hand and do that. Uh, I did a very long, ambitious card routine there. It's never been published. Uh, it never will be published. Uh, part of it will be published, but uh, part of it incorporates some ideas that I'm not at liberty to, to uh, share. But that was a very long trick. The, the final phase of that, the final buildup, at, at almost a five minute buildup for the last time the card comes to the top. And you can't do that everywhere. You couldn't do that everywhere. Very effective trick. So that's the whole thing. What are the restrictions of the venue? And what are you going to do to make that be as organic feeling as you possibly can in the place? That's amazing advice. And then obviously, off the back of that, we traveled around a bit. We ended up in Canada, which is where we are now, hence the hat. And I, I think I need to point out to people that aren't aware, you are still publishing material. I'm, a, I'm on your mailing list. I buy stuff off your site all the time. Because you're publishing it yourself and it's not going out through Murphy's and all other magic dealers, there's probably a section of people out there, especially newer magicians, that don't know about michaelclose.com. Yeah. But I mean, you've got stuff coming out all the time. Uh, I'm a habitual purchaser of everything that you have. And there's some incredible material on there. Can we talk about that output and what you've been doing with, with yeah. that site and why you decided not to put it out through other magic dealers and keep it to yourself? Well, um, since it's digital content, um, you know, the, the, um, the impetus to move from those uh, exquisite plastic comb bound books that are in your library to uh, digital uh, really came from the fact that uh, it is just a giant pain in the ass to go on a lecture tour with books. I mean, you're breaking your back hauling this stuff around. And, uh, you know, somewhere down in my core, uh, I'm a teacher. Uh, my father was a a really fine teacher. He taught at the uh, Purdue uh, University campus in Indianapolis. He was uh, in their mechanical engineering technology department. Probably the last human being on earth to get a full professorship while only having a bachelor's degree. And it was because of his uh, real world experience. So he was a great teacher. So in all of the books that I write, I, we'll start go back to the worker series, the goal there was to teach. The goal there was to teach. When I first started lecturing for magicians, I was really unhappy with how it was going. And Chuck Fain, uh, my old friend Chuck Fain, who's in Australia now, Chuck said to me, you're dissatisfied, aren't you? I said, yeah, I sure am. He says, you know what you're doing wrong? I said, no. He said, you're trying to teach. He says, don't teach. Demonstrate and explain. Don't teach. They're not going to be in the mood for teaching. And you can't teach at a magic uh, club meeting. And you really can't because the level of the audience is too many different levels. You have no common ground to even discuss things. But in the books, I really do want to teach. I want you to be able to understand the thinking that goes beyond that. So since my goal is to teach, uh, as these digital things became more viable, it seemed to me that the most effective thing I could do would be to combine text and either illustrations or photos, which we've already done with the workers' books, and combine that with video. Because there are some things that video does better than text or photographs combined. Um, it can show the timing of a move, which is really a, the rhythm of a move, very hard to convey in print. It can show you what a slide is supposed to look like when you've mastered it, so you understand what your goal is. It can more clearly represent the movement of things through three-dimensional space. So, and it really changes the way you write books. Now, uh, Roberto Giobi's Card College uh, series that was published through library.com was the first PDFs to come out to have embedded video with them. 
But what they did was they took the card college text and just stuck video in. Closely Guarded Secrets was the first magic book ever written from the ground up with the intent of adding video to it. And that changes the way you write a book because sometimes it's easier just to say, rather than explain this, take a look at this video. So the way we originally did it was we would shoot this video and we could embed it in a PDF file. And then Adobe, and then it was, it was like Harry Potter's magical book because you, you get to this place and you'd read it and you'd click on this image and all of a sudden this video would spin in and you could see what the thing was that I was talking about. Well, then Adobe started playing not nicely with everybody. And as they released newer and newer versions of Adobe Reader, people were not able to get the videos to work, the embedded videos to work. So we had to figure out a different way to do it. And the way we do it now is all the videos are uploaded as unlisted videos uh, to YouTube. So you do have to be connected to the internet um, you know, in order to watch the videos, but that's really not a big thing. But the big jump we made is, is, to go, is going from PDFs to EPUB. Now EPUB is the format that you use to read a book, um, you know, like a standard you know, liter uh, fiction book or nonfiction book on, on a tablet. And what EPUB has going for it is you can change the font size and if you lay it out correctly, every, any graphic elements like photos or whatever, they stay where they need to stay. And for somebody like me, whose eyes uh, you know, get poorer over the years, this is a lifesaver because if you read a PDF on a tablet, unless your eyes are really good, if you're looking at an eight and a half by 11 thing on a little tablet screen, that text is too small to read, which means you're gonna have to zoom in which means you're gonna spend a lot of time scrolling and then zooming back and scrolling and zooming back. And with EPUB, you don't have to do that. It's fabulous. And uh, so you've got text, you've got photos, and now the videos are linked through the internet. So you wanna see what something looks like, you click on that, you leave the, the e-reader program, goes right to your browser, opens up, the YouTube thing is right there, watch it. All you have to do is hit the back, back button on your tablet and you're right back into the book. And it's, it, to me, the experience is no different than sitting in my chair reading a book at this point in time. So that's why we made this shift away from paper products. And because of that, we want to maintain control over our products. So if you want them, you get them from me, nobody else. And that's just the way we do it. Um, of course, because they're digital products, we're ripped off the instant we put out a new product. And all I can hope is that the people who understand how much work goes into these things will give the, um, the creators of this kind of product uh, the benefit and support them by buying. If you buy any of my books, any of my eBooks from anybody but me, you're getting a knockoff of it. So that's just something that's important to know. If you buy it from a website in China, they've knocked it off. And I'm not getting a cent of that money. So now, as far as the, um, the eBooks go, uh, we took Closely Guarded Secrets and we completely updated it and put it into this EPUB format. You know, so now it works everywhere. And in addition, Lisa also lays out a PDF. So if you wanna print out pages and put them in front of you and make notes on them and you know, scribble on them and have them in front, they print out beautifully. If, you, if you're the kind of guy who likes a bound book, well, print it out and find it somehow. You could, you could do that. Uh, so we give you both of those files uh, when we do it. Um, the Paradigm Shift books came about, uh, there's two volumes of them, simply because I, I've been changing my mind about lots of things. Um, for example, uh, in, um, in one of the workers' books, uh, I wrote an essay called The Big Lie. And the big lie is that it's fun to be fooled. And I made the joke that if it was fun to be fooled, Richard Nixon would still be president. Um, but I wasn't, my language wasn't clear enough. And Josh Jay sort of took me to task on it because he said, you know, I, I, I do magic for a lot of people. And they, they love being fooled. I thought, ah, okay. Yes, that's true. There are people who like that, but there are people who don't. And so what I should have said was, 
how are you going to handle the people who don't like to be fooled? Not that everyone you know, doesn't like to be fooled, but you're, if you're working as a professional, you will encounter those, especially in the, the, the social situation of a, of a restaurant magic or cocktail party magic. And so there were all these things I wanted to go back and revisit and explain this a little more thoroughly. And so that's what a lot of the, uh, of the paradigm shift books are. Um, this idea of system one and system two, which were explained in Daniel Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. I think this idea has such profound impact on how you construct magic. It's, it's really something. Um, and uh, the paradigm shift itself is actually a move. There's a, a, a way of performing, but basically is a classic pass. But uh, the, the mechanics of it, the pressures of it are different than you've seen before. And it's pretty much an invisible pass that you can do on stage or anywhere. It's really something. So that's where the title came from. But also it has the play on words because it is a paradigm shift. It's a way of looking at things that I looked at one way and looking at them a little differently. Um, a lot of the material in those books came about because of my work with people who take private lessons with me. And they would bring in an effect and we'd start to look at it and take it apart and figure out what's going on with it. And they would, um, you know, we'd find a whole new, a whole new trick in there. Uh, and there's some things like the Ikea card trick is in there, um, things like that. So it's, they are, they are really dense books. Um, there is a trick in the paradigm shift called uh, end game which is a trick you can do with the Aronson stack. And I believe that the, that particular routine rivals the Tamara's idea of ending the, with the deck back in new deck order. I think it's even stronger than that. It's one of the strongest tricks you can do with a memorized deck if you do Aronson. It only works with Aronson, unfortunately. And it was a discovery really of something that was built in Aronson that he didn't know was in there. Um, and, and essays and more things like that. So anyway, that was book are jammed full of those kind of things. Um, the Tom Epiphany ebook came about because of the fact that there are only three ways to do any magic. There are only three basic ways to do any magic. Um, so let's take the linking rings. Well, what are the three ways? Well, the rings are already linked. The second way is the rings were never linked, but they look like they were linked. And the third way is one of the rings has a gap in it, so you can link it. There is no other way to lose the linking rings other than that doesn't fall into one of those three categories. And this holds true for just about, for every trick that you can think of. There's only three ways to do predictions. It's forced, so there, or it gets done after the fact, Let's see, there are three ways, what is it? Uh, the prediction switch, or it's forced, and there's another way in there. Or you have more than one, you have an out. It's not, it's, or you have multiple predictions that you can reveal. Only three ways, you can't find me a prediction that doesn't work under one of those things. Now that's enormously frustrating. Why should there only be three ways? Why isn't, it, and then you start thinking and you go, well, you know, the number three in human beings' lives is extremely important. We group things in threes. There's here, there's there, and there's the space in between. There's morning, noon, and night. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Uh, Larry Curly Moe. Things that fall in threes, like the punchlines of jokes. It, the best way to set up a joke is in three, the rule of three. You set it up, you reinforce it, and then you the punchline veers it off in the direction that gets the laugh. So in thinking about this and being really frustrated about it, I realized there is a fourth dimension that we're not using. And the fourth dimension that we're not using is time. Well, how can you use time in a magic trick? Well, the way you use time in a magic trick is to somehow, while you're doing the trick, to distort a memory of something that's already happened. That means that when you go back and try to reconstruct the trick, it's impossible to because what you've remembered is not the way that it's happened. Mm -hmm. And in this manuscript, there's a way of doing the pothole trick now that makes it an un, unexplainable, absolutely unexplainable trick. 
And tying in with this idea in the Tom Epiphany is something else I've come to recently, which is the idea that, you know, we've been talking about presentations and stories and what have you, and, 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 and you know, eliciting, you know, engagement with the crowd and, and uh, getting an emotional hook and what have you. Um, oh, and now I just ran off and I forgot where I was going with that. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, but I don't think it's a magician's job to be a storyteller. A story is going to be a part of what you do, but I don't think it's the main job. I believe a magician's job is to turn the spectator into a storyteller. And I don't know that this has been emphasized enough in magic. In other words, when I perform for you, I want to leave you with a story. I want to leave you with a story that you can tell your friends. And if possible, and I can leave you with a souvenir with that story, that's even better. That's even better. And if I can distort memory so that the story you're telling them is not the way it happened, but you believe it is, now I'm a miracle worker. Now I'm a miracle worker. So there's actually a way to do that with the pothole trick. So you leave them with the card, you leave them with the story, but you've distorted the path. Now, this actually began back in the workers' books. There's a trick in the workers' books that nobody does called a trick for O'Brien. And O'Brien was the grand inquisitor in George Orwell's 1984. What happens in that trick is you walk up to the table, you've never met the people, the spectator freely selects a card. The card he selects turns out to have the only red back in a blue back deck. And on the back, it says, happy birthday, Frank. And you'd never met them before. You've never met them before. Well, what, what happens in that trick is that I change the past. Because when the, when the card comes out, it says, happy birthday. And there's a space and it has an exclamation mark. And so when I show it to them, I say, look, and it says, happy birthday, Frank. Well, to the people listening, I'm just saying his name after that comma. And he's blown away because it's a red card. And now I take out my pen and say, let me autograph this for you. And I write Frank on, I fill in the blank. My name has already been signed on the other side. Or I, and then I turn it over and sign my name. And now he's got a souvenir. And now he takes this thing into the world with him and says, I've never met him before. And now this card had my name on it. Well, that's the, that's the springboard for what happens in the Tom Epiphany. And I believe it's capable of producing material that defies explanation. You simply can't figure it out. So that's that ebook. And the, the newest one is called The Road to Riffsville. And that was a complete rethinking of uh, unstructured uh, memdeck magic. So uh, I used to call it jazzing, but jazzing is the wrong word. And I call it riffing now, simply because it's it's not free improvisation. You're not you're you're basically using little tools that you've already set up. Um, one of the things that I've completely discarded is uh, any correction after estimation. So in other words, they name a card, you make some type of estimated move, and wherever the card is at that point, that's where you produce it from. Mm -hmm. There's no correction. Because if you're correcting, that means that you had something planned ahead of time. Well, that's not improvisation. So uh, that's what that is. And I think it's a revolutionary new approach to Memdeck magic. I, I don't know how many people have ever started. And unfortunately, I'm no longer in a position to be able to get in my laboratory and have five hours of work every night to try it out. But those are the new things. Um, the other thing we've been trying to do on the website is to offer what we call targeted training. And that is, uh, those are streaming videos where I get to do a deep dive into a particular subject. I mean, really go deep into it. So there's three of them I've got out on Memdeck Magic. Uh, there's one about how to design a three trick set. There's one about how to palm with confidence and some basic tools for that. There's a really good one called The Truth About Lying, which is, you know, how do you use lies in, in a magic show? Can you, is there a trick you could do with and only tell the truth? And there are. 
um, all kinds of strategies for doing that. So uh, the newsletter that comes out, uh, I try to review uh, if there's a new book out, I try to review it. Uh, the one that's out just now for July has Sylvain Jusson's new book, uh, Every Card You Take. I talked to Roberto Giobi last month about his um, Sharing Secrets book. I talked to Richard Kaufman about uh, Mr. Jennings Takes It Easy. John Carney about his um, Secrets and Slights book. And so I really try to give these guys a little bit of a, a boost because I know how hard it is to publish a book and put it out there. But and there's all kinds of material on the website. All we ask is if you want to access it is to give us your email address. Uh, you pick a password and uh, give us permission to send you uh, an email every now and then if we got something new that's going on. But I think you get an awful lot in return for it. And I'm going to put the URL down below. It's michaelclose.com. Michaelclose.com, yeah. It'll be in the description as well. And I'm on your mailing list and the stuff you send through. So your your um, newsletter is great. It really is. Thank the whole thing. Before we wrap up, Michael, I want to ask you one more thing because I, it, it, I, I can't talk to you about your career without bringing this up. Obviously, recently, you've become very involved in Penn and Teller Foolish. Yes. Uh, um, so, I mean, I... I as far as I'm aware, you're, you're, you're taking Johnny Thompson's role in that, in that show now. Is that, is that right? In well, um, to the extent that I am the main magic consultant, uh, Johnny Thompson uh, was the magic consultant along with Paul Stone on season one of Fool Us, which was shot in 2011 in the UK. Um, that series was not renewed, but the CW network in the United States bought those episodes and started to show them and they got good ratings. So they wanted more episodes of Fool Us. So season two was the first shot in the United States at the Penn and Teller Theater. Now I had worked uh, with Penn and Teller who I've known for many, many years uh, and Johnny when I lived in Las Vegas. I worked on lots of stuff that went into their show, uh, the selfish, the Cell phone in the fish was part of the thing I worked on. The TSA, um, the uh, vanishing uh, pygmy elephant, just, just all kinds of stuff. Uh, I also uh, helped, uh, worked on the uh, underwater TV special that they did, but that's a whole other two hour conversation. So anyway, um, when they got, we're preparing to do season two, um, Johnny uh, said, well, I really would like to have Mike be part of this. By this time I had moved back to Canada and um, Penn and said, absolutely. So they pitched it to the producers and I got hired. So Johnny and I were the two magic consultants uh, for the first few years there. And I, and I always considered Johnny to be the senior consultant. So when the judging happened at the end, it was really Johnny and Andrew Goldner you know, doing the talking and I mostly did the listening because uh, it gets too crazy with too many people trying to talk. We got headphones on and they're, you know, so. Uh, and then Johnny uh, collapsed um, a few years ago, uh, just as we finished the first full day of rehearsals for season, uh, I guess it was six. And so I did season six all by myself those two weeks in Las Vegas. And that was a real challenge. And then moving forward, you know, Johnny and I worked together so well because we had the same aesthetic view of what magic should look like. And the main reason for that was Johnny's mentor was also Harry Reiser, uh, my mentor. And Johnny also, uh, you know, Charlie Miller and, and Vernon were very big influences on Johnny, which came, that, that came to me through Harry as well. So when we looked at magic problems, we worked very much at odds about how to solve them. We had the same approach to solve them. So we worked very well together. And when Johnny went down, the thought of having to train someone to think the way I think just seemed like way too much work and was going to cause, cause me more work than it would have been if I just did it myself. So for the last, for season 7A, 7B, and... Um, season eight that we just got done, I've been the sole magic consultant. And other than the fact that it's a little mentally grueling, uh, the fact that we are able to do so much via Zoom has really been a way that uh, we get a whole lot accomplished. Um, a lot of the things that really made me crazy in the early seasons of Foolish have disappeared and become much, much, much smoother. 
uh, I mean, we could spend two hours just talking about Clueless, but that's, um, that's really, I mean, if you have specific questions about what I do, I'd be happy to fill you in on that. But that's basically the situation uh, as far as my being the magic consultant for the show. Well, one question I do want to ask you is, I, I've interviewed a few of the guys that were on that first season. And they talked about how they were very nervous because at the very beginning, nobody knew what it was about. Penn and Taylor had this reputation of the bad boys of magic and they had no problem trashing magic. And, and so it was a bit of a, a risk. Oh, what's going to happen when I go on that show? If they see how the tricks work, am I going to be, yeah. uh, have my career destroyed? Fast forward eight seasons, it's still just as popular, if not more popular than it was back in the day. But people don't have that concern anymore. So I imagine you have more people applying to the program i suppose my question is twofold one I can, how has it evolved over the years two do you think that there's going to be a longevity there for a few years to come and three for somebody watching this that wants to be involved in fool us is okay, there any well, advice about how they can actually get on sure. there and uh okay so refresh my memory what was the first one how has it evolved yeah has it evolved okay is from your opinion so, the the in the beginning here's the interesting thing perhaps about clueless i never watched the first season i've still never seen the first season and the reason i didn't watch the first season was i didn't like the title of the show because the fooling part is if you work for real people the fooling part is the part that separates you from an audience in other words, I know how it works. You don't know how it works. So we're on opposite teams. And I don't want that when I do magic. I want us all to be sharing this. This is astonishing. I'm just the conduit that lets this happen. So I wasn't too crazy about that and never watched it. But it was explained to me and explained quite well that if you go to a network and you say, I want to pitch a magic show for you. No, nah, we're not interested. We don't need magic show. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. No, well, hang on there. This is different because people come on this show and they try to fool Penn and Teller. And if they do fool them, they get a prize. Oh, it's a contest? Okay, we understand contests. So it's like, uh, it's like dancing with the stars. Okay, we understand that. He goes, yeah, yeah. But then Penn at the end, he explains how the trick works. Oh, it's like the mass magician. Oh, we understand the mass magician. Okay, we'll buy your show. And then of course, none of those things happen. So um, it's just the hook that got it on the air. Now, what makes it very difficult is, I believe that Fool Us was really Penn's idea, this, the genesis of this show. And what makes it tough is when Penn thinks of ideas for things, he doesn't come from a magic background. So he comes from ideas, from an intellectual thought, uh, from a concept. We want to talk about TSA and and how our rights are being removed by what TSA is going on to do. And then the trick comes from the idea. So when Penn comes up with something, I can't go to Tarbell to find the answer because there is no answer. because Nobody's ever done this before. So with Fool Us in particular, it's the end of each act when Penn talks to the acts. It was the most nebulous part. And really, there were just some crazy, horrible dumb things that happened, which I will lump under fog of war kind of situations. Um, so that if you ever came up to me and said, how could this guy have actually fooled Penn and Teller? I would say, well, there's a story behind that. And that's all I can say about it. So don't worry too much about that. But over the years, what we have done is, uh, and in particular, after Johnny uh, died, I felt very uncomfortable with that last, with, with the fool us part. And I wanted to make it more clear cut. I wanted to make it as fair so that everybody understood how that process worked, that there's no ambiguity. And we worked that all out. And the other thing we had to do as we were revising that is we were getting so many more acts from outside the United States, people for whom English was not their first language. And if you try to give coded information to somebody for whom English is not their first language, you are out of luck, Jack. It's not gonna happen. So that part of the show has been made, I believe, as fair as it possibly can be. I mean, the magicians all understand, I have their back. 
if they pull, you know, if Penn and Teller are fooled, you're going to get a trophy. If Penn and Teller aren't fooled, you're not going to get a trophy. But it's not being decided while they're talking to the person. It's already decided before Penn and Teller even talk to the people. And the way that works is Penn and Teller talk. Andrew Golder, one of the executive producers, and I listen and we say nothing until they get to the point where they have said, this is what we think is going on. Then we talk. So, you know, there's no hints, there's no help, there's no, well, we like this guy, let's give him a trophy. That doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. It's a, it's a very fair process. And I really want people to understand that. And I also want them to get over it too. It's not the purpose of the show. It's nice if they fool them, but it's not the purpose of the show. No. So that part has been worked out to my satisfaction and it makes my life and my ulcers a lot easier as we do it. Now, as far as getting on the show, we certainly hope that there'll be a season nine. It's always a challenge with each successive year. Uh, it becomes more and more challenging to do the show. I would say what you want to do is, first of all, familiarize yourself as much as possible with what's been on the show. So if you've got a card trick that you want to you know, submit, you ought to take a pretty good look at what other card tricks have been on to see what people are doing. If you have a version of Matrix you want to put on the show, you know, you probably don't want to put a version of Matrix on the show because we've done that trick a lot. Non-card items have a better shot at it simply because we don't get a lot of non-card items. And consequently, since it's a variety show, you're not competing against card guys to get on the show. You're just, so that's a good thing. The trick has to be about five minutes long. That amount of time has dwindled since season two. Season two was about six and a half minutes and now it's down to five. That's a network thing and I don't even try to fight. It's just the way the world works and so that's what it is. You should do a trick that you've done a thousand times. Don't pitch an idea. Take something that you've worked out in the real world where you have an engaging presentation, something interesting for a television audience to watch. And then um, I'm not gonna give it out now because it would, uh, not be worthwhile, but usually in October or so, we find out if we've been renewed and I blast it out on social media and everywhere that I possibly can. And then you just send in a video to the uh, uh, address where you submit videos. I usually tell people just to put it up as an unlisted YouTube link and then uh, hope for the best. And that's the way it works. And that's the way it works. That's, that's amazing. That's really great advice. That's fantastic. Michael, we're going to draw this to a close, but I have one final question, which is, right. what's next? And, and what I mean by that is your legacy is set. If you decided to never perform again and drop out of magic and uh, just play piano for the rest of your life, people would be talking about you for decades to come with all of the work that you've put in across so many different things. Genuinely, your legacy is set. Is there, but I mean, I'm confident you're not going to be going anywhere. Is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you, you well, want to do? I, you know, I don't know that I have a magical bucket list. Um, I'm always trying to figure out better ways to explain things. And this has been one of the great things that's come from doing these private sessions um, is that, especially because they're being done, you know, through, through a computer screen. <clears throat> so how do I impart this information in the best possible way that I can. How, it's like with the Pharaoh Shuffle uh, book. I mean, I figured out a way to impart the knack of that so that you can learn that without my holding your hands and showing you what's going on. So I do have some things that I'm still working on um, it, it, for that kind of a, a situation. And that's, that's a big project that uh, my wife and I are gonna try to get finished uh, before the end of July. It's, it'll be similar to the um, the Pharaoh Shuffle one or the Pauling uh, eBooks in that it's really gonna be devoted to one move, but a way to learn it that nobody has has really uh, exploited properly. And then with some tricks that uh, are brand new. I mean, a couple of things that are absolutely brand new. So that will be coming out. Um, as I come up with things, I just, you know, uh, I play with them a little bit and I, I think people will be interested in them, then I publish them and put them out there. Um, it would be nice to find a place to perform again, I think at some point in time, I do miss that. I miss getting the laughs. I, 
miss getting the gas. Um, when uh, my wife and I adopted our daughter in 2007, I sort of much decided that I wasn't going to be on the road as much as I used to be, which is why I've sort of limited my convention appearances and things like that. Um, and, you know, did the editorship of uh, MUM for, you know, those nine years and, and what have you, and this kind of work that I can do at home. But, um, I, you know, I, magic still fascinates me. It's, I still find it really interesting. I keep trying to find connections and deep truths and things that will, you know, make it stronger and more magical and to be able to uh, tell that to people. And so I'll just keep doing that, you know, and uh, as long as people find it valuable, that, that, that makes me happy. Um, Amazing. And I think that's about all that's about all I can say about that. Can I can I ask you, you've mentioned several times uh, private sessions. I, I, I didn't realize you did private sessions. If I do private sessions. Uh, and they would like to. Uh, uh, you can uh, find a link to that on michaelpost.com. Look up private sessions. There's a link there. Um, and it's I believe it's remarkably valuable. I do it several different ways. I've got uh, you know, a bunch of guys who I see on a regular basis. I prefer to do it on a regular basis, although for some guys, you know, depending on their work schedule or what have you. Um, uh, there's several ways to do it. One way to do it is if you're working on a routine or a couple of routines and you'd like me to put eyes on it and see what I could offer in terms of, you know, ways that I could maybe polish up what you're doing. Another way is simply working on technical things you know, trying to move forward that way and, and you know, get some, uh, you know, there's a couple guys who I've just completely changed the way they've handled playing cards. I mean, it's, they, you know, just talking about those kind of things. Um, but the price is reasonable. Um, it's, uh, I, I charge 75 bucks for an hour. Uh, that's US. And usually those lessons run a little more than an hour. I don't really, I'm not one of those that kicks you out the door when the clock ticks like a, uh, you know, a psychologist does, or a psychiatrist, and um, I think it's very valuable. I mean, uh, one of the things I'm going to I'm going to do with the permission of the people is uh, there's a few people who are going to be on Fool Us, and after their spot airs, I'm going to get their permission to show you what their act looked like when they auditioned, and what it looked like when they got on Fool Us when uh, when they were did it on Fool Us, and you won't believe the difference. You won't believe the difference. Um, you know, it's a mentor is really important. I was very lucky. You know, Harry Reiser um, was uh, a very successful businessman. He didn't need money. He wasn't going to charge me to hang out and talk to me. But uh, by the same token, he wasn't going to continue talking to me if he didn't feel like I was making valuable use of the information. So my payment was to take what he showed me and think about it and come back with good questions. Um, but it is a source of income for me to do that kind of thing. And, and it can be a big help to have uh, a fresh pair of eyes, like a director, you know, uh, seeing what you're doing. And also to have somebody, you know, I've been in, interested in magic now for 61 years. So um, it's a long, long, you'd think I'd be better. Um, it's a long, long time. But yeah, that's available there. And I'm happy to, you know, if anybody has any questions, you know, they can reach me on, uh, through the website and I'm happy to talk to them about it. That's amazing. Michael, this has been an incredible interview. I've done over a hundred interviews for this channel now. And this has been, I, I would say my favorite. I've been a huge fan of yours from literally day one. You've been a big influence on my career. And uh, I know that everybody that's watching this is going to get so much out of it. So thank you for taking the time thank you uh, and um you know we've uh, we barely scratched the surface i gave you the uh i gave you the uh, cliff notes uh, version of that so you know if you really want to dig deep let me know happy to do it again sometime whenever you have a moment you do a part two i'd love that and i'm gonna i'm gonna put a link down below so that people okay. can go and check out your stuff i highly advise everybody to go and get on your newsletter and definitely you know, private lessons with Michael Klaus, that's amazing. Um, Michael, one more time, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Craig. Thank you. Be safe.